After 25 years, the death of John Bonet Ramsey, is still, an enigma that haunts the collective American psyche. Because the case is still open, we reserve the right, to offer an answer. An answer to what has been called, the most infamous, unsolved modern murder mystery. Who, murdered, John Bonet Ramsey? According to John Ramsey, when he found John Bonet's body in the basement room, he removed a piece of duct tape from her mouth. This piece of duct tape was later analyzed, and it was found that the impression from John Bonet's mouth was static, and there was no evidence of movement. This means that the duct tape was very likely placed on her mouth, but after she was dead. If John Bonet was dead, why would an intruder, play duct tape on her mouth? We believe, the duct tape was placed on John Bonet's mouth, by John, as part of the post-death staging of the kidnapping scenario. The reason John removed the tape, when he quote, discovered, John Bonet's body, was because he believed that his DNA was already on it. So when John discovered the body, he made sure to handle the duct tape. The so-called ransom note that was left at the Ramsey's home demands $118,000. And we now know that $118,000 is the amount of the bonus John Ramsey well, who has this now? Uh, the wife didn't have the knowledge. She doesn't know anything about that. This is money that's electronically placed in his uh, 401k at the end of the year. To tell the end of the year. Me uh, more about the person who's responsible. This person has a very unique, intimate knowledge about his his financial workings. Therefore, the person would have to be somehow related to uh, his his employment. The note's author, demands a ransom amount of $118,000. This peculiar amount, was almost identical to an annual bonus, that John received from Access Graphics. There seems to be a consensus, that this could not have been a coincidence, and that the writer, must have had direct knowledge of John Ramsey's bonus. We can speculate about who else, could have possibly known about the bonus. But who is the one person, we can almost guarantee knew. We believe, that John included the figure in the note, for multiple reasons. First, to misdirect police, and create a potential suspect pool, at Access Graphics. And second, as a reverse psychology stratagem. Knowing that he would already be a suspect, if John was directly accused, of writing the note, he could argue that including the figure would only lead back to himself. And third, consider that the amount demanded in the note is a relatively small sum. We believe, that this is because, if John would have withdrawn the money, he would have had to essentially write it off, as a loss. We believe, that this is why the ransom amount is so small. $118,000? How's a small foreign faction going to split up $118,000? Team Ramsey contends that a kidnapper came through this basement window, and went up to John Bonet's room. If this was the case, the kidnapper passed several exits, on the way back down to the basement. If the kidnapping scenario was true, 
and the intruder intended on taking John Bonet, he would have used those exits. Why would the kidnapper go back the same way that he entered? In other words, if the kidnapper could not fit John Bonet out of this window, which we are told is the same window that the kidnapper entered, it makes no sense for him to just give up. Doesn't it stand to reason, that this kidnapper would seek other exits? We believe that the window and the suitcase, only make sense, as a staged scene. If the intruder used the suitcase for a step, would they not place it parallel and up against the wall for better balance? Considering what we believe to be a staged scene, it would not be a stretch, to conclude that John probably manufactured the scuff mark, to create the appearance that an intruder went through that window. John claims to have broken the window, after being locked out of the house, but months before the morning in question. We believe that it is very possible that John actually broke the window the night of the murder. But why the story about being locked out? It is important to note, that according to the Boulder PD, the metal grate outside the window, was reported as undisturbed on the morning in question. This would suggest, that all activity around the suitcase and broken window, occurred inside the basement. We theorize that John utilized the window and suitcase, and staged them to create a scene. A scene that police could not ignore, as a possible entry way for an intruder. John was unaccounted for, around 10.30 am, on the day in question. He later claimed, that he was in the basement, looking for anything out of place. If this is true, why did John fail to check the wine room? If an innocent John Ramsey had genuinely searched the basement alone, at 10.30 am, there would have been no reason for him to skip the wine cellar room. An innocent John, would have unlocked it, turned on the light, and discover John Bonet's body. The search timeline, of the morning in question, only makes sense, if a guilty John, was aware that John Bonet's dead body was in the room. Even Detective Steve Thomas, believes that an innocent John, should have discovered the body at 10.30 am, but chose to protect a guilty Patsy. If a guilty John Ramsey had searched the basement alone, it makes sense that he would report that he found nothing. Again, this must be reiterated. If an innocent John Ramsey had genuinely searched the basement alone, at 10.30 am, there would have been no reason for him to skip the wine cellar room. We theorize, that a guilty John had a reason, for failing to discover the body when he was alone in the basement. We believe that John wanted to quote, discover, the body with someone else present. This is why, John chose to discover the body at 1 p.m., while Fleet White was in the basement with him. A piece of paintbrush, was used for the garrote, that was found tightened around John Bonet's neck. Evidence from the autopsy, suggests that the paintbrush was also used in a sexual manner, to abuse John Bonet. 
Although the paintbrush was from Patsy's kit, the hand strength required to break a paintbrush would be difficult to achieve by most women, let alone a genteel woman like Patsy Ramsey. Most men, on the other hand, possess the strength to break a paintbrush into three pieces. The paintbrush was broken the night of the murder, and we believe that this is a small, but crucial piece of evidence, that yet again, points toward John. The knot used to secure the cord to the broken paintbrush was somewhat intricate. John was in the Navy and a recreational sailor. He knew how to tie an assortment of knots. At 1 p.m., on the day in question, Detective Aunt asked Fleet White and John Ramsey to search the house again. Minutes later, John would emerge from the basement, holding in front of himself the stiffened body of John Bonnet. Fleet White and John Ramsey would later tell police that they opened the basement door that Officer French failed to open and found John Bonnet wrapped in a blanket with duct tape on her mouth and cord tied around her neck and wrists. John would later say that he attempted to remove the bindings. John seemed eager to contaminate, and in a way destroy, the crime scene. Again, John probably removed the wrist bindings and duct tape, because he believed that his DNA was already present on them. John carried her stiffened body from the basement. After John placed John Bernay's body on the living room carpet, he asked Detective Aunt if John Bernay was dead. Detective Aunt would later say that John Bernay was clearly dead. During this moment, Detective Aunt would internally question John's innocence. Does John's question seem genuine to you? Again, John carried her stiffened body from the basement. John spent time attempting to remove the bindings. Ask yourself, wouldn't John have known she was dead? We believe that John's question was insincere, and an attempt to create doubt in his involvement. In other words, if John had to ask if she was dead, how could he have murdered her? Detective Aunt seemed to have seen right through this apparent deception. The mere existence of the ransom note, and even more important, the origin of the materials used to create it, make the likelihood of an intruder, almost non-existent at this point. The paper and pen belonged to the Ramses. The note was almost certainly written in the house the night of the murder. We cannot reasonably deem the writing in the ransom note as the author's normal writing. Obviously, methods for disguising the author's normal writing would have been employed by the culprit. The ransom note must be considered an instrument of deception on multiple levels. The physical handwriting is only secondary to the actual content of the ransom note. Identifying the mind behind the ransom note is the key to identifying its author. For example, the use of the term, stray dog, found in the ransom note. In a police interview from 1998, John uses the term, stray dogs, to refer to strangers that Patsy would invite into the home. This could be a simple coincidence, and many will dismiss it as such. But consider how many contexts that you have used the term, stray dog. We believe, that by writing the ransom note, John was creating out of thin air, another party that could be blamed for John Bonnet's death. In previous content, we have laid out in detail, our theory, 
that John synchronized the ransom note with his plan to dispose of John Bonet's body. Notice how the note provides the time, materials, and opportunity to allow John to get John Bonet's body out of the house. We believe that John basically wrote the plan to dispose of the body directly into the note. This would explain what seems to be the superfluous use of language. Because of the diverse conclusions regarding attributing authorship, we dismiss all of the handwriting experts as paid witnesses. The ransom note is the most profound and insightful evidence in the case. However, it is ironically also the most deceptive and misleading evidence in the case.